So today I'm gonna to do a little bit of an update about what I have been making, what I've been working on, what I've been knitting and spinning and weaving, and I wanna talk about bringing a loom back from the dead. Hi there, thank you guys so much for joining me. My name is Felicia from Sweet Georgia, and this is Taking Back Friday. This is a space where we come every Friday and we talk about knitting and spinning and weaving and dyeing. I like to talk about the fiber arts. I also like to talk about how important it is to make time to make things. Now, I wanna share with you some of the things that have been happening with my time over the past couple of months. You might have seen that I snuck away for about two days to go to Whistler with one of my girlfriends and uh, just to get away and have some quiet time to just be <laughs> perfectly silent. So we went somewhere where it was actually not permitted to speak, which was fantastic. Uh, very, very relaxing. So one of the things that we were doing while we were at Whistler was shopping in the village, wandering around, and discovered that at the Lululemon store, Lululemon is making ponchos this fall ponchos and so I tried on a couple of their ponchos and they're so nice and I really wanted one but I thought I could weave my own and so what I did was I actually just right now took the the stole or the shawl that I wove for one of the courses it's a I think it's a four shaft weaving course and uh, I just pinned it together with some double pointed needles for now uh, just as a placeholder and then I'm gonna sew it together and then I think that this is a pretty good prototype for a nice poncho. I'm gonna, I could make it in different colors. Uh, right now they're made with basically complementary colors. So kind of a golden and a kind of a teal color together and then overlapped with a purple. But, but if I made it more like analogous colors, like maybe they're all blues and greens or maybe they're all blues and purples or maybe they're all purples and pinks, something like that. It could be a much more, uh, it could be much more vibrant. I could do it all in grays and make it like a very gray cover up. Lots and lots of different things that I could do. So I thought rather than buying that Lululemon poncho, I'm gonna weave my own poncho somewhere in the midst of all the other things that I'm doing. The other thing that recently happened was our annual camping trip with the families that we met in prenatal class. Like we have been going on this camping trip for many, many years now. Um, yeah, since the babies were maybe two, something like that. And uh, this year we got rained out. <laughs> so I, I got very little knitting done. I had, my plan was to knit my sweater this is the soundtrack sweater, the Marie Green soundtrack sweater. And my plan was to get to the point where I'm at the body, uh, where I can just stock in it all the way down and just zoom through this whole thing. I am still on the yoke. So I have not got to that point yet at all. And I'm on the yoke and kind of slow because as you can see, I have made a mistake. So I guess I wasn't paying attention or, you know, doing things, whatever. Uh, I only did four, no, I only did three rounds of the main color in here. And here I did six rounds. The right thing to do is to do six rounds, but for some reason I missed doing three extra rounds. And so you can see it just doesn't look right. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna finish the sweater and then I'm going to cut in this section where there's three rows and, uh, I'm gonna separate the two parts. I'm gonna knit, I'm gonna pick up and knit the extra rounds that I need, and then I'm gonna graft it back together. Tell me if you think that this is a terrible idea or if I should just move on um, and just pretend that it's supposed to be like that. But I don't like it. Like you can see that it's just not right. You can see it's not right. So anyways, that was my plan. That didn't really happen. I also, brought hand spun socks to knit and also didn't really knit on those very much. I knit those in the car for maybe a little bit. I also finished spinning and plying all of these yarns that were going to be in a shift cowl. This is the one that I'm gonna be making. It's part of my make nine. And so I finished plying them, finished Oh yeah, this is when I showed you guys um, how I was rewinding the bobbins onto storage bobbins and then I would ply from those, finally plied them, finally washed the skeins. They are lovely. I have no idea how much yardage is in these. 
So let me tell you about the loom behind me that I brought back to life. Basically, probably more than 10 years ago, uh, I, when I was learning how to weave, I was getting all my girlfriends into knitting and also trying to get them into weaving at the same time. And so one of my girlfriends, her parents live on Salt Spring Island, and somebody on Salt Spring was de-stashing all of their weaving stuff. So out of that de-stash, came to us, four girls, uh, three different weaving looms. One of them was a Leclerc 36 inch wide floor loom. That one went to my girlfriend, Jen. And then there was another Leclerc loom that's called an initiation loom, which is basically, um, it was a direct tie up loom. It was four shafts, each shaft tied to one treadle. So if you wanted to raise shafts two and four, you'd have to use two feet to step on two treadles. So that loom went to my girlfriend, Jo. And then Josephine decided to move to California, and so she had to de-stash that loom again. So I took that loom back, and then now that loom is with Charlotte at the studio. The first loom, that 36 inch wide Leclerc loom, ended up going to my studio because Jen didn't have space to put it in her house anymore. And so that went to my first studio at 4th Avenue, and I used that to teach weaving. I actually used that, I think, to teach Bridget how to weave crazy. And then we ended up selling that loom to uh, one of the girls that I taught at Place des Arts, Marianne. So all of these looms have history. All of these looms have these meandering journeys. I always think of it kind of like the sisterhood of the traveling pants, but it's the sisterhood of the traveling looms. I mean, just this morning, I got a text or a message from Katrina, and th the title is um, Free Loom. Do you need one? <laughs> And so the third loom that came out of the situation was this loom here. This loom is interesting. It's a table loom and um, it's four shaft table loom. And it was made, it looks like, by somebody named Harley Darnell. And it's under the name brand Cottage Crafts. Cottage Crafts looms. I have tried to find more information about this particular loom, but there's just very, very limited information. Um, if anybody knows anything about these looms, I would love to hear more, but I believe it was a spinning and weaving uh, maker in BC, in British Columbia, and he used to make Indian head spinners. So Indian head spinners, like an Irish tension wheel, it's very coarse, makes very thick yarn. It was one of the wheels that I learned to spin on when I first started taking classes at Place des Arts. So he made these bulky head Indian spinners, and he also made these looms. Now, this loom went to my girlfriend, Michelle. And so this table loom, after sitting in my girlfriend's apartment for a couple of years, I think she really decided that uh, she really needed that space back. And so the loom came to me. Um, this loom has been sitting also at our studio for years. And <laughs> the people at the studio are like, we need to make more space, so please take it away. So I took it and it has been in my garage for probably about a year. Yeah, so sad. So in preparation for this camping trip, we were cleaning out the garage, getting all our gear, pulling everything out, and my husband's asking me, what are you gonna do with that loom? Is it, is it, is it going to recycling? What's happening with it? And I looked at it and I thought, it's actually still a great working loom. It has all the pieces, it has all the parts, it has all the heddles, it has a four dent reed, it has everything all set up. The only thing that I needed to do was basically clean it up. And so I have seen people do loom restoration. You know, they take all the pieces apart, they clean them all up, refinish them, sand them, put them back together again. I did not do that with this particular loom, but I did clean it up, dust it off. I refinished it with a whole beautiful coat of Danish oil so that it's all nice and clean and finished. It smells amazing, it looks amazing, like the color of it is different now too. It's it's really lovely. The reed was rusted, so there was a yeah, it was just gritty and rusted and that would that would shred your yarn as it goes through. So I took that and took some steel wool and just basically wiped it all off so that way it was nice and smooth again. The reed is great, four dent reed, totally works. And um yeah, 
I basically cleaned it all up and then warped it and it works really well as a sampling loom. Table looms are great for sampling. You can do any sort of combinations you want and because it's sort of like a smaller size, it's smaller everything, um, it feels much easier to get onto the loom. Probably took like a couple of hours for me to put this warp on the loom. Super, super easy. So this loom was rescued from being sent to the recycling, basically. So you know that on my Make 9, I have been wanting to make these rugs. I've been wanting to learn the technique for making croquebrac rugs. But all of my looms are occupied, you know, like this loom here, the spring loom, it still has the cut off pieces of the epic cloth. But because it's tied in this way and there's like, I don't know, 600 ends or something like that, I don't want to tie on something that's 50 ends. I want to use this warp for something else that is similar to this project. And then uh, the baby wolf loom, I'm using that to make all the projects for the school right now. So that is very much occupied, but I want to learn this croak brag technique. And so what I thought I should do is basically use a table loom to sample with, to just try to figure out how this all works. And so that is what I'm using that loom for now. So. The croak brack is set up as a point twill. So basically I thread the warp ends on shafts. One, two, three, two, one, two, three, two, one, like that. Very, very simple. And then it's just figuring out how to apply the color in order to create these very graphic shapes. So what I was doing was basically sampling with this loom to try to figure out what is the best way to go about this. Uh, I initially sampled at sort of eight ends per inch and you can see that is, uh, it is way too close together and it's not weft faced. You can only, you can see the warp yarn and we don't want that at all. So I had to sort of widen the set a little bit. So this was six ends per inch, a little bit better, but you can still see the warp yarn a little bit and it was hard to beat down. And so I went all the way to four ends per inch. So that's four ends per inch and that makes a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful cloth. Now this is, uh, it's very thick because it's a lot of yarn packed down into this. I'm using the Harrisville Highland. The Highland is the thicker version of the two yarns that uh, Harrisville Designs makes. And uh, just practicing with different colors, practicing trying to figure out how to make these shapes. It's very fun, very exciting. So I just wanted to share with you guys bringing this loom back from the dead, basically because there are lots of looms that I see available on Craigslist, on Kijiji, all these marketplaces where sometimes the looms are falling apart, sometimes the looms are really old, sometimes they're kind of dirty, and you might not want to get something that's really extremely terrible. But the things that have been lightly used, the equipment that has been lightly used, can be cleaned up, can be refreshed, you know, old reeds can be cleaned up and polished so that they're workable again. Lots of things can be used. These things, these tools last a long time. You'll see that there are sort of quirky things about this loom. Like the shafts are uh, activated by pulling down on these toggles and three of the four toggle button things are gone. Um, so I just basically tied knots in the string and so the knots basically hold those shafts in place. It works, it's not perfect, it works. And it works for my purposes right now, which is just sampling. You can also see that in the reed, um, the, the beater, the beater was designed, I guess, for a smaller reed. And right now there's a Leclerc reed in there, which I guess is a little bit taller than what the uh, loom manufacturer originally designed it for. And so somebody has jigged the beater so that way uh, it's attached some wire to hold on to the top of the beater bar so that it holds the reed in place uh, but sort of expanding a little bit to add that extra room so that the larger reed can go in there. It's just all sorts of wacky hacks to make this thing work but it works. So I wanted to show you that you can very often get an older loom, get a loom that has been neglected or abandoned, and you can still make it work. A lot of the times we're talking about, you know, brand new looms that cost hundreds or thousands of dollars, and they don't need to. You really can rescue something like this from a marketplace like Craigslist or something like that, and make the, the loom 
become a weaving tool for you again. Um, basically, right now, what we're doing is we're just sampling, we're testing, it's experimenting. Sometimes, uh, if you just want to figure out if you like weaving, you're not going to invest in a brand new loom. Something like this might work as well. So now before I go, I just have a couple of updates and reminders to let you know about. We have our mystery knit along. The Sweet Georgia Mystery Knit Along is starting September 1st, so you can get your kits for that now. All of the conversation and everything is happening within the School of Sweet Georgia, so you can basically get your pattern, get your yarns, and then join us in the School of Sweet Georgia to have all the conversations about this, and the first clue will drop on September 1st. The second update that I want to let you know about is the Advent Calendar. So the Advent calendar for Sweet Georgia is coming back this year. Last year we, we didn't make one. Last year we had to take a break and just be like, oh my god. It's a huge, huge endeavor. And this year we are making it significantly different from in previous years. Um, and so all the details are going to be shared very, very soon through our email newsletter. So you want to be sure that you're on the email newsletter list if you want to get notified about when the advent calendar uh, launches. So just make sure that you're on the list and make sure that our emails don't go to spam because then you'll miss the update. <laughs> So that is basically it for today. I am gonna go now and sew up the side of my poncho and also wind a bunch of warps for projects that are coming out this fall. <gasps> yeah, so if you like this update, please do hit the like button. And if you would like to see more content like this where I talk about knitting and weaving and spinning and dyeing and all the things about the fiber arts, please do hit subscribe. And we come here almost every Friday to share with you things about yarn and craft and color. Thank you so much for being here. I will see you in the next one. All right, bye for now.